Jesus had cast out these demons, probably a couple of thousand demons out of this man, and all of the people uh, came and they were trying, they were getting him to leave the area. So here it says, Jesus in verse 1, Jesus stepped into a boat, crossed over and came to his own town. Now the funny thing is, in, uh, in um, the, the Gospel of Mark, it says to his own home. I don't know if this is Jesus' home or not, because... Do you remember a couple of weeks back I preached on Jesus had nowhere to lay his head? He was homeless. But in Mark, this is placed in chapter 2. So this is placed before. So this, perhaps Jesus had a home, I don't know, that then left it in order to do kingdom work. This might be Peter's home. Sorry? Could have been a B&B. <laughs> or it could have just meant this was his hometown. We're not quite sure, but we can, that's something that we can think about. Say, okay, is this Jesus' son? Is it Peter's son? Think about it. You feel like a Berean and search these things up. It's very interesting. So here, he's gone to his hometown. Verse 2. Some men brought to him a paralyzed man lying on a mat. When Jesus saw their faith, he, saw them, uh, he said to the man, Take heart, your sins are forgiven. Now before we get into that amazing statement... Um, in the other gospel it says that actually there's four men, there's some men that bring Jesus to this home. And they've come to that place where there's so many people packed into this house. Jesus is inside preaching the word it says. There's so many people packed in and even spilling out into the, into the door. There's no way they can even get through. I would like to say obviously his hometown, they've heard that Jesus is doing miracles. They've heard that Jesus is... Uh, commanding demons to come out of people and nobody has ever spoke like this Jesus was just amazing he had such authority in the way he spoke so his hometown are like what? he's coming home to Capernaum so they've, they've, they've just packed in this house it'd be a bit like if Jesus came here I mean my goodness the whole town would just be shoved in this little chapel wouldn't they spilling out, out. and so here these people like whether they're family whether they're friends whether the people know about Jesus the real needy, the ones who need healing, are like, how do we get in to this house? How do we get in? How would you get in? These guys are awesome. Now, yeah, through the roof. So these guys, they're very proactive in what they're doing. They're concerned about their mate. <coughs> There's a few of them. It says that four, uh, four were carrying him. So they're concerned about him, but they have the faith to try and get Jesus in this house. They can't get him through the door. There's too many people. So they have this faith, but one of the things I've noticed about these men, they act upon their faith. They're not just sitting there moaning and grumbling like, oh, poor us, we can't get in there. There's too many people in there. What are we going to do? Sometimes we do that, don't we? we? We see an opportunity and we think it's too difficult, so we just grumble, so we can't do it. These guys had faith and said, we're going to get in that house no matter what. Now, in our Western mindset, we think of a house, don't we? Like... If we look out there, pointy roofs with a chimney, and we're thinking, how, how do we get someone through the roof? It's not the same in them days. They were like, sort of, first, there were only one floor, but normally there was, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, I've not been to Israel, but that normally they would have stairs going up outside to the roof, and the roof would have tiles on it uh, under, the, under would be sort of these slats or wooden panels, but then on top would be, I don't know, mud or grass or straw or whatever. They literally, it says they had to dig into the roof. So here these men have carried this man up onto the roof and they've started, <laughs> they've started to dig into the roof. Um, so they've created a hole now big enough to lower Jesus into the room. Now, I want you to picture that. Jesus was in this room and he was preaching the word to, to all these people. Probably rammed like this. Um, and all of a sudden... It's, it's, you can see it's quite comical, can't you? Like, four bits of rope coming down is like... She's like... I should imagine Jesus probably just chuckled and went... Fuck. And that's where he says... He's, he, he, looked at their, he looked at them and wondered about their faith. And he looked at the paralytic and he said... Take, be of good cheer. Take heart. I mean, I could see the joy that comes from Jesus. Because these guys are like... They are going to get this man healed regardless. And Jesus is like, wow, these guys have amazing faith. 
I mean, they've literally just dug the roof up, lowered this man into it, and it's like, here he is, what are you going to do now, Jesus? And Jesus is like, I love these guys. Because they acted upon their faith. That's, Jesus loves it when we act upon our faith, when we have faith um, for healing, and faith for that. But we realise that um, he said, take heart to this paralytic, be of good cheer. Now he says these amazing words, and this is probably the most important truth you'll ever hear. Your sins are forgiven. Your sins are forgiven you. We'll get back to that in a minute because this is really, really important for us to know. But the Pharisees got a bit, a, pick, a, a bit of a pickle by what he said here. The Pharisees are actually sitting down and they're not actually saying it out loud, but they're saying it within their hearts. They're saying, Who oh, is this man? Thinks he can forgive sins. Does he think he's God? <coughs> And Jesus said Jesus discerned that. He, he, he knew. Now whether Jesus had a word of knowledge, or whether he, just because he was God, he used that power, or whether he just had that discernment. That these, guys are, these guys are... Have you ever noticed that? Sometimes you can, someone's looking at you, you can, see, you can kind of perceive what they're thinking in their hearts. Jesus is looking at their faces probably, thinking, yeah, these guys, I know what they're up to. <coughs> but they're saying to him, in their hearts... He is a blasphemer. He is claiming to be God because only God can forgive sins. Which is just powerful, isn't it? So Jesus says this in verse 4. Knowing their thoughts, Jesus said, Why do you entertain evil thoughts in your heart? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and walk? What do you think is easier to say? They're both easy to say, aren't they? <laughs> what is easier to say? If you say your sins are forgiven, can you prove that your sins are forgiven? So if Jesus said to this man, your sins are forgiven, can he, can he prove that he's forgiven his sins? Can he By the guy that gets up and walks. Yeah. Now if he, if he says, get up and walk, he can prove that that guy has got up and walked. Mm. So what here he's doing, now which one's more important? Getting up and walk, being healed bodily, or being forgiven of your sin. Which one's more important? One is temporal, one is eternal. Forgiveness of sins is the most important thing because it's a healing of the soul, which obviously gives you eternal life on into eternity. So what he's going to do here now, he's going to prove, let me try and get this straight, this is a bit of a tongue twister. He's going to do the more difficult one to prove the easier. He's going to do the one that is harder to prove to prove that he can do the one that is more difficult. Or the one that is most important, sorry. So here, that's a bit of a, a tongue twister, isn't it? So he's doing the one that, in a sense, your sins are forgiven is easier to say, but it's far more important. So he's doing the healing now to prove that he can be the one to forgive sins. Do you get me? Mm -hmm. Sorry, I'm not confused. Well, one's connected to the other, isn't it? Through the sins, there's healing. Yeah, but we're not going to get into that today because I want to concentrate on the... Now, I agree with you. Whenever you look at the Scriptures, even in the Old Testament, Psalm 103, you, you usually have them combined. Healing and, and, and forgiveness. Healing and forgiveness. I would say this. Um, he, forgiveness is primarily what is achieved on the cross but one of the benefits of that is healing and I've received that I did that about three weeks ago you know willingness God's willingness to heal me and his word I would say if, if you're after healing get a fresh word from the Lord um, do you mind Jim if I say something? no, no. It, Elizabeth said about Hezekiah for you ah oh, right a word for Jim so Jim's perhaps you've got to look at that word and say I'm going to yeah uh, Jan's had it as well, so I'm going to use that word and apply it to my yeah. life. That is my word for this season. I'm going to believe that, trust in God for that. That's what I did with Matthew 8. It, it said that he bore my sin, sickness and my disease, and I said, boy, I'll have that. And I got fresh word from the Lord, and I got healed. He sent forward his word and healed. That's, praise God, we've gone off, off topic there a little bit. Can I just go off topic? Go on, Andrew. It's amazing, really. You know, it's just 
Jesus died for our sins, and yet he was actually forgiving sins before he actually died as well. Yeah, it's an interesting one, isn't it? Because he's saying to this man, he says, like, he's looked at their faith, now whether he's looking at the man's faith and, and the men's faith, he said your sins are forgiven. Now he's not gone to the cross. No. He's not paid for the sins, but yet he's forgiven the sin. It's a mystery, that one, isn't it? Mm. And if anyone's got any answers, please come and tell me afterwards. But Jesus is able to forgive sin because, I mean, I think in, in hindsight, he's going to the cross, so he knows that's what he's going to do. So he's saying, look, I'm going to go to, to you, your sins are forgiven because I am here for that purpose and I'm going to die for you and for or who, who else will believe in me by faith. I was just thinking about that, you were just thinking about the bed going up through yeah. the roof as well, that <clears throat> they were on the four corners of the bed and they were all whatever I could truly imagine. And, uh, you know, they were stretcher bearers. They were believing in faith for his healing and were believing with him. Yeah. Which I think is... That's powerful, isn't it? I, I thought about that this morning, but I've completely forgot about that. But that's a really good point, isn't it? How important it is, is like Jan said, is for us to be stretcher bearers. I like that. For us to lift people up, lift Jim up in prayer at this time. He needs our prayer and our support. And others as well. There's so many people. So we can all be then people carrying each other. Brilliant. We'll, we'll close this. It's brilliant. So where are we? Here we go. So which is easier? We know obviously the easier thing to say is forgiveness of sins. But he does the harder thing to prove that he can do the thing that is more important. So if you look here um, in verse 6. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the paralysed man, get up, take your mat and go home. The man, you can imagine, he just all of a sudden, power started coming to his legs. Power started coming to his arms, to his whole body. I don't know how he must have felt, but he must have felt pretty good at that time. He just got up. The man got up, just walked out right in front of them all and went home. And the crowd saw this and they were absolutely amazed at what they saw. And you would be too, wouldn't you, if you saw, saw that. It's just absolutely fantastic. Now, we'll come back to this when we, when we close, because we're going to go and speak about Matthew. But here is, is the importance of bodily healing. But actually, the more important thing Jesus is concerned about is your, the, the healing for your soul. Because, as we'll see when he calls Matthew in a moment... It's so important. That's the reason why Jesus came. He came to save sinners, of which I'm the foremost, Paul said. Because actually it's our soul needs healing before God. So that's really important. But actually one of the benefits from that is bodily healing. And one of the things I'm very aware of, the body of Christ are not reaching out and believing for healing like these men did in faith. They're not doing it. And I know myself, when I pray for someone, I would have unbelief sometimes, and I think, get up and walk, and I'd be like, I didn't really believe that, you know. But we should be in faith, believing. A man that James 5 says, you know, call the elders of the church, let them anoint you with oil, make a prayer in faith, and they will be healed. I mean, it's not a if or but, it's a promise of God, and I think we should be standing upon that. I think we should be praying for people more and more and seeing healings. I've seen healings, I've seen loads of healings, powerful healings. But not enough. But, uh, but the point is, is the most important thing we always should remember is the, the, the healing of the soul, which is the forgiveness of sins, because that's what gets us into those pearly gates. It's, it's important, isn't it? So let's go on to the next bit, which is calling of Matthew. Now Matthew is a tax collector. Now, does anyone know who Matthew is? We're actually reading his gospel. Now, what a transformation, this guy here. Because it says, as Jesus went from there, he saw the man named Matthew was sitting in a tax collector's booth. Now, what was a tax collector known as? A crook. A crook. <laughs> Can anyone think of a helpful analogy? I was thinking one this morning. I keep, I keep thinking about um, um, traffic wardens. Because everybody seems to, have, like, you know, when they put a ticket on your car, people are like, I hate it. But actually, traffic wards are only doing their job, aren't they? They're honest men. 
Um, it would be like a traffic warden, yeah, getting commission for every ticket they put they put on your car. And if you were each off the, on the double yellows, they'd be slamming it on there every time, yeah. yeah? That would kind of be the it's not the equivalent, but it's yeah. it's it's pushing that way. Isn't it? It done. You've seen it done. <laughs> But these guys, how a tax, a tax collector was actually commissioned by the Roman Empire for them town. So here, this town of um, Capernaum, um, the tax collector, there would be contractors. You know, when I builders, they all put in contracts for, for building sites. And the one who put, puts in the biggest bid wins. So Matthew is obviously sometimes put in a big bid and said, oh, I will promise to give the Roman Empire this amount for this town. Yeah? And whatever he had over, he could just pop it. So the Romans didn't know that. They knew about this. They knew that they were a bit crooked. And that they, that's why the tax collectors were rolling in it. Mm. It's funny, there was this one, I forgot his name. There was a tax collector who was known as an honest tax collector. And, and it was so rare that this guy had a statue erect in, erected in Rome because he was honest. <laughs> He probably wasn't, as, wasn't very rich, I should have meant. <laughs> but Matthew here, we're not quite sure if he's honest or not. It doesn't say. But again, you, you've got to imagine these taxes affected the fishermen. And you can see these disciples, most of them are fishermen. And they've probably been heavily taxed, overtaxed by Matthew. So you can understand how they must feel. And you can understand... If you, you can understand what Matthew would have felt like, you know, if he's in this position where he's, he's taken taxes, he's probably thinking, I can't get out of this. I'm already known as a crook. I'm, I, I, nobody really likes me. I'm only, I'm only in with the crowd, the other tax collectors. Yeah? So you can imagine how perhaps rejected he might have felt. So when Jesus walks up to him, can you imagine the suspense? What's he going to say? And what did Jesus say? Two words. Follow me. Now, I, I, I just think of myself in that position, the moment I gave my faith to the Lord, to know that there is a God who will say, follow me, regardless of what I've done in the past, is pretty powerful to me. Because I will tell you, I have been into some horrible stuff. I, I was a rascal. Believe it or not. I still have not Thank you for that. Isabel. And the moment I knew, once I found out that it was true, and then I realised, actually, could this God forgive me? And I struggled with it for a while. There's other people that have struggled with it. People like, um, I think, John Wesley and even Charles Spurgeon struggled with that truth that God could truly forgive us of our sins. Because if we think back of our life, we have done, I mean, if you're like me, you've been into some stuff. That is pretty dodgy. You've hurt people. You've hurt yourself. Um, you, you've done some stuff that has messed your life up a bit. You know, uh, I still suffer sometimes with circumstances which I messed up in my past that still come up and bite you on the backside. Um, but those things you have to deal with. So circumstances might still be a problem, but actually God promises to forgive you and say, follow me to every sinner. And, and praise God for that. So where are we? Lost my place. Calling of, Calling of Matthew. Follow me, he told him. And Matthew got up and followed him. I should imagine he was like, boy, I'm going to do that. It, you know, it, it, the moment he decided to, to follow Jesus, there's no way he would have got his job back. Not a chance. So he's like, I'm in this. I'm going to accept this. I'm going to follow him. Now it's amazing... Matthew uh, follows Jesus and the first thing he does is invites all of his tax collector friends to his house to meet Jesus. But we see this, don't we, with, with the woman at the well, the first thing she does, go and runs and tells the town. These guys are instant evangelists. Now you hear some people saying, you know, you need to, you need to be discipled for a hundred years before you can go out and witness for Christ. I don't see that in the scripture. I see the fact that they meet and can't wait to tell people about it. What? He's just asked me to follow him. Do you know who I am? I'm a tax collector. Even Jesus used that analogy when he said, you, you know, love your enemy. 
You know, if you love those who love you, don't even the tax collectors do the same, you know? So he used that as a way of people going, ooh, yeah, tax collectors. But this guy is amazing. He goes and tells all these <coughs> tax collectors to join him at his house and invites Jesus. So here Jesus is sitting with all the tax collectors. What a sight that is. Praise God for that. So Jesus loves even the tax collectors, which is, which is brilliant. So while Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said, It's not the healthy who need a doctor, but those who are ill. But go learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. I've not to come to call the righteous, but sinners. Now, this is interesting. I went through this with Scout last night. And I said, I was talking that the Pharisees were in a sense the healthy ones. What Jesus' plain words here. And that us who are Christians are the sick ones. And Scout goes, no, no, the Christians are the healthy ones. I said, yeah, I know that's true. But actually, no, he's realising healthy means... Here, in this context, I am okay, I don't need a doctor. The sick ones are the ones, actually, I am aware of my sin, I need a doctor now. Yeah. Can you see the difference? Yeah. Yeah. So healthy being, I'm self-righteous, I know. Now if you ask a non-Christian, you say, do you think you're a good person? What do they say? Yes. Well, yeah. yes. Do you think you're heaven? Well, I'd like to think so. And what merit do you say that? Because actually, the Bible says that if you've broken one law, you've broken them all. If you've stolen a pencil at a betting shop, I wouldn't recommend you go to a betting shop, but Jim's laughing. <laughs> uh, sorry? Ikea pencil is theft. No, but we've all done it, and we all sit like... Yeah, the moment I would, I, I mean, I still sometimes accent style. This is recording, isn't it? No, I'm yeah. not going to say that. No, but sometimes you have to watch your speed, don't you? Or well, if you don't watch it, that's my excuse. Anyway, it, you can go over a little bit, and you've broken the law. Well, the God is saying, actually, if you've broken one commandment, you've done it all. So really, here is our awareness of our own sin and our shortcomings. Awareness of our sin. That is where we need to be. Not to stay in that place, but we need to be in an awareness that we have sinned before a holy God. All of our life rebelled against Him. It all started, if you go back to Genesis 3, you know, Adam and Eve, they rebelled against God by disobeying Him. They could have eaten of any tree, but they ate the one that He said, don't eat. Yeah, when they ate it, they were hiding, and God says, Where, why are you hiding? We were naked. Who said you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree? So you see here, we are naked before God because we're very aware that we are in sin, we're in about rebellion against God. But actually, that's why Jesus came. Jesus came, he said here, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but those who are ill. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice, for I am not to come to call the righteous, but sinners. So that's the reason why he came. That's the reason why he came, came on the cross. That's the reason why he gave his life for us on the cross. Because actually he's laying his life down as a penalty for our sins. So that we don't have to pay the price. So Christ sacrifices once and for all. Yeah, it's the penalty that we all deserve. And what he does is but by, by going on the cross and being a sacrifice once and for all. That means we don't have to die. That means we don't have to be punished because Jesus has been punished for us. It's a word that's used in theological terms as propitiation. God satisfied punishing our sins upon his son. Now obviously Jesus died on the cross. He took our sin. But then he was in a tomb. He was buried. And he was rose on the third day. And now because he is the one, he's the first fruits of the dead. See what happens is... We are forgiven of our sin when we believe in Him, but then actually, we, when we die, then we have eternal life, a new life, because Jesus is the one that's gone before us. He paid for our sin, He rose from the dead in order to bring us. He was the first fruits with the second and third and fourth and fifth and whatever fruits into eternal life. Does that make sense? Yeah. So you must be aware of your own sin in order to uh, put your trust in Christ. 
Because if you're not trusting in the finished work of Christ for your sin, that means you're not saved, which is a very, very important thing. We need to know and trust only in the sacrifice of Christ. There's nothing in us that's good, only the goodness of Christ. If you're not trusting in that to get into heaven, I would question if you're going to get there. Because actually, that's a really important truth. He who knew no sin became sin for us, that we might be the righteousness of God in Him. And that's how we get saved. So it's really, really important. So the two, two things here we, we're seeing, the paralytic, it's what you would probably, he felt the lowest of the low. God come and healed him and restored him back and forgave, forgave him of his sin. He did the most important thing he could do to this man because it was eternity. The second story we see is Matthew the tax collector. It's kind of the other end of the scale. This man is, has probably a, a frivolous life and lots and lots of money. But yet he too was aware of his sin and God and Christ came and saved him. So you can see two comparisons. Whether you um, feel that you're the lowest of the low or whether you're, you're uh, doing extremely...